Warning, this video contains subject matter that may be disturbing to some viewers. So let's get the housekeeping out of the way. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes only. All of the information gathered is from news sources or an internet search. And any opinions expressed by me is just that, my opinion. With that being said, let's jump into it. Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Mysterious Cases. Now, you can't have a true crime channel without talking about the Chris and Shanann Watts case. I'm sure that most of you guys have heard about this case. It has been widely publicized in the media. There is an upcoming movie and there was recently a documentary on Netflix called An American Murder, The Family Next Door. And there's enough videos here on YouTube to satisfy anybody's hunger for more information on this case. So with that being said, I'm going to do a basic overview of the case. Just in case there are people out there who haven't heard of this case or need a refresher. Chris and Shanann Watts were originally from North Carolina. They met in 2010, were married in 2012, and had 2.5 kids. Chris and Shanann relocated to Frederick, Colorado in 2013. They built a massive five-bedroom home where they would then begin to build their little family Bella Marie Watts would be their first child. She was born December 17th, 2013. And a couple of years later, she was followed by Celeste Catherine Watts, who was born July 17th, 2015. And her family lovingly referred to her as Cece. In 2018, Shanann would be pregnant with their third child, a baby boy, that they planned on naming Nico. Chris would work for Anadarko Petroleum, and Shanann worked from home via the internet for a company called Thrive, which is a multi-level marketing company run by Lavelle. Shanann was very active on social media. She posted nearly every day, either about her business or her little family. And via Facebook, you could really get to know Shanann and who she was. Okay, are we back? Okay. Sorry, guys. I got a call. Good morning, Jessica. So, sorry. Today's kind of been crazier. Day two of Black Label 2.0. Um, dancing. While I'm cooking dinner, I made homemade meatloaf, homemade mashed potatoes, made green beans. I think I'm going to make some dessert, maybe brownies. Sounds delicious. From the outside looking in, they appeared to have a great relationship. Shanann's Facebook was plastered with videos and pictures of them having family time, going on vacations, going to ball games attending work events together but behind closed doors there was much more going on than anybody really realized on august the 13th 2018 shanann returned home from a business trip to arizona and her friend nicole atkinson dropped her off at home at about 1 48 a.m that morning. Now, Shanann was pregnant at the time with baby Nico, 
and she had a OBGYN appointment for later that morning. And her friend Nicole Atkinson was trying to reach her to check on how the doctor's appointment went. But Shanann wasn't answering any of her calls or texts. When she couldn't reach Shanann by noon that day, she went to her house. She rang the doorbell, she knocked, but she didn't get any answer. She called Chris, who told her that he thought Shanann had taken the kids to a play date. He encouraged Nicole not to call the police and said that he was sure Shanann would show up. But Nicole wasn't having any of it, and she went ahead and called the police. Hey, man. Ben. How you been? Hi. You Nicole? Yes. Okay. What's going on? So, my friend, um, we were out of town for a business trip this weekend. Right. And I dropped her off at 2 o'clock this morning. She's 15 weeks pregnant. She wasn't feeling well. And she had a doctor's appointment this morning at 9, and I told her to let me know if she needed me to take her. She's got two little girls. And um, she was very distraught over the weekend, wasn't eating normally or drinking, and we kept trying to force it on her because she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, her husband and her supposedly are separating, but she didn't know this. She thought they were just having issues. He disclosed that to me today. Because okay. I called him, and I was like, have you talked or heard from Shanann since you left for work this morning? Because I can't get a hold of her. I've called. I've texted. Her car's in the garage. Her shoes she wears every single day right by the front door. She only has. Scott, how you doing? How's it going? So this was the only vehicle she would have? Only one that yeah. she would drive. Okay. Chris gave the police permission to search the home. Her car was still there. Her purse was found there. Her cell phone was found in the home. But Shanann and the girls weren't there. And at one point, Chris came out of the master bedroom and said that he had found Shanann's wedding ring on her bedside table. Police ended up leaving after the search, and there was still no sign of Shanann. Nobody had heard from her or the girls. The following day, on his porch, Chris gave an interview to the Denver Channel 7 news team. He gave the interview to plead for the return of his wife and children, but the interview was just very, very awkward, and he seemed to just ramble through most of it. No, I don't even want to just like throw anything out there. Like, I hope that she's somewhere safe right now and with the kids. But I mean, could she event? Could she just taken off? I don't know. But if somebody has her and they're not safe, like I want them back now. Like that, that, that's what's in my head. Like if they're safe right now, they're going to come back. But if they're not safe right now, that's what, that's the not knowing part. Like if they're not safe, I, I, last night I was, I had every light in the house on. I was hoping that I would just get just ran over by the kids running in the door and just like barrel rushing me, but it didn't happen. I know the first time I ever saw that video, I was struck by the lack of emotion that he had. And he just didn't seem sincere at all when he was apparently trying to beg for his family's return. In the late afternoon of August the 15th, Chris was arrested after he failed a polygraph test and ultimately confessed to killing Shanann. At first, he said that he killed Shanann after he witnessed her killing the girls because he had told her he was going to leave. But he did later confess that he had killed Shanann and both of the girls. He would then lead the investigators to where he had buried Shanann in a shallow grave and place the bodies of his two little girls in oil storage tanks at his job site. He was charged with five counts of first degree murder, including an additional count per child cited as death of a child who had not yet attained 12 years of age and the defendant was in a position of trust unlawful termination of a pregnancy, and three counts of tampering with a deceased human body. Police also discovered what the probable motive was for Chris annihilating his entire family when they heard from Nicole Kissinger, 
who had been dating Christopher Watts for what she claimed was maybe about six weeks. She claimed to have known that Chris was married, but that he had been telling her that they were basically separated, just living in the same house, and were fixing to be filing for a divorce. Now, she adamantly denies that she was involved in anything to do with Shanann and the girl's disappearance. Um, there's been a lot of debate on the internet about this, though. Um, just a lot of little things that don't seem quite right. For one, her internet searches. It appeared that she had Googled Shanann Watts a full year before she claims that she even met and started dating Chris Watts. She also Googled marrying your mistress and appeared that she was searching for information on the internet as to whether married men actually left their wives for their mistresses. She Googled about whether law enforcement could retrieve deleted phone messages and texts. And since she liked to Google so much, she could have easily searched for Shanann's Facebook profile, which was open to the public, and seen that Shanann was very pregnant and very much still invested in her marriage to Chris. She deleted most of the text messages between herself and Chris before turning the phone over to the authorities. Now, I'm not going to say that she had anything to do with the murders. But in my opinion, she's about as shady a person as they come. And before I forget, she also Googled Amber Frey. And what was Amber Frey's net worth? Now, if you remember, Amber was the mistress of Scott Peterson who murdered his pregnant wife. Y'all, this girl had the audacity to Google Amber Frey's net worth and how much did she make on her book deal. Shanann and the girls weren't even cold yet, and she was trying to figure out if she could somehow make money off their murders. And let's not forget her creepy voicemails that she left for Chris. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> I guess just call me back when you have a chance. Bye. Now here's where I have to say she has not been charged or found to be connected in any way to the deaths of Shanann and the girls. So it's not against the law to be a shady and downright shitty person. Well, we haven't heard much about Nicole Kissinger since all of this occurred because apparently she's been in hiding and even legally changed her name. In November of that year, Chris pled guilty to the murders. He was sentenced to five life sentences, three consecutive and two concurrent without the possibility of parole. He received an additional 48 years for the unlawful termination of Shanann's pregnancy and 36 years for three charges of tampering with a deceased body. Christopher Watts will never see the light of day again. There's no doubt that Shanann's loved ones are devastated. They lost half of their family to somebody they loved, cared for, and trusted. With that, I will end this episode of True Crime and Mysterious Cases. As always, thank you for joining us. And don't forget to hit those like, subscribe, and notification buttons so that you don't miss any future episodes.